good morning once again. And uh, you guys believe what we just sang there? God will make a way. God will make a way. And he wants to do something new even here today. I hope that's the prayer of your heart. You know, I realize sometimes we come into church and, you know, it's just, we're kind of cruising through, we're doing our thing. But we got to stop and we got to think about that. God, I'm here. I want to hear from you. Teach me. Change my heart. Help me to see you anew. So, so important. And I hope that will be our attitude as we get into God's word here in just a minute. Uh, just one last thing I want to say before um, we jump into God's word, though. Just a new ministry opportunity I just want to put in front of you guys today. Um, as you guys are leaving today, out on the back table out there, uh, you're going to find an opportunity for you uh, to come alongside me and to help me in some different ways, all right? Uh, what I'm looking for is I'm looking for a group of people uh, who will be willing to commit to being pastor's prayer partners. I realized very quickly here, and I, I don't know on this, okay, but especially in the last couple weeks, and again, kind of sitting, settling in here a little bit, I can't do this job myself. I can't. That's just all there is to it. And um, I don't want to do this job myself. Maybe that's a better way of putting that as well, okay? Uh, I want to be doing what God wants me to do. I want to be strengthened by Him. I want the wisdom that only He provides uh, so that I can shepherd this church to the best of my ability. And uh, so if what I'm asking for and looking for is I'm looking for a group of people who will be willing to sign up and will be willing to commit to praying uh, specifically for me each week. And uh, on the back table back there, uh, there is a sign up, uh, list, some little cards out there that Burke has put together for you uh, to fill out. If you are willing to be one of those prayer partners, I'm gonna ask that you do that today. Grab one of those, get that filled out, drop it in, the, there's a blue basket out there, you can put that in. And then also alongside there, there is a prayer sheet that is out there today. And uh, what I plan to do uh, with my pastor's prayer partners is I plan to put out a prayer sheet for them every single week. Um, it will give you my anticipated schedule. I will tell you it is never set in stone, uh, but at least will give you an idea of what I got going on each day during the week um, and things that you can be praying about. And then additionally, um, there's also a set of prayer requests that kind of pertain specifically to me and the ministry that God has given me uh, here at SMBC right now. And um, if you are willing to come alongside and to be one of those pastor's prayer partners, I would love to have you in on that. Um, as you sign up, uh, you can either get that uh, weekly per request from me, either by email or I will have hard copies back there every single week. For those of you who just kind of prefer to take that up, pick that up and tuck that in your Bible and take that home with you. Um, but I will tell you right now, there's no limit on the number of people who can be involved in this. Uh, so if every single one of you want to sign up, that's great. If you don't, that's, that's perfectly fine as well. Uh, but I know how much I need people to be praying for me. And if you would be willing to do that, I would love to give you the opportunity to do that and try to do that in a very specific manner. Uh, so as you're leaving today, uh, once again, those are back there on the table. So as you're going out the doors, I believe they're on the table to the right of the doors as you're leaving. And uh, if you want to get a part of that, we'll have that out there for a couple weeks. Uh, but you can sign up and start getting those updates and uh, start praying for me. Uh, I would very much appreciate that. All right. So kind of a cool opportunity and I hope the one that you guys will, uh, will take advantage of as well. And uh, so again, uh, by week, just so you guys know, uh, we'll be here Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, working on some different projects and different things, doing a little bit of studying. And then we'll be heading up Thursday morning uh, up to Northeast PA once again for my daughter's wedding. And uh, we very much covered your prayers with that. Um, it's very weird. We're going back to our house with nothing in it. And um, we don't even have any food there right now. We're, <laughs> we're talking about that this morning. How, what are we, how are we going to eat? But you know, at least we've got a place to put our heads down. But we got a lot of families starting to come in over the next few days. And I um, appreciate your prayers for their travels. And again, most of all, for the gospel as it goes out through the wedding ceremony. I know that's Miriam and Nate's desire more than anything else. Is that people come to know Jesus. And if their wedding can be used as a tool to make that happen, even better. All right? So um, that's kind of what I got going on this week. Uh, but uh, if you have your Bibles this morning, we're going to get back into God's Word at this point. So Genesis chapter 39. Genesis chapter 39. As we're going to talk this morning about this, God is in control when you're stuck in a dead end. You guys have all had that experience, right? 
you're driving along, and then it's that beautiful yellow diamond sign, dead end. Anybody in favor of those? Mm, yeah, I didn't think so. <laughs> I've actually had two times in my life now where I have lived at the end of dead end streets. And uh, it's kind of amusing, honestly, to live on a dead end street. Um, the first one really wasn't that big a deal. Uh, there was a cul-de-sac at the end, so there was plenty of room. You know, someone actually aired down our road. They could swing in, you know, and do the whole loop all the way around and, and get out. But the first one, though, it was very different. It honestly wasn't much wider than what this aisle was here, okay? A little dirt road, two very deep ditches on each side, and that meant no room for K-turns, no room for U-turns, and every single time that a car got to the end, you had one choice. You backed up very, very, very slowly. It was kind of amusing to me as a kid because um, my bedroom was actually right above our driveway. We were the last uh, house on that particular street. So that meant a lot of times when people got stuck at the end of our road, which they did, that our driveway was the one that got used for that turnaround. And I can still remember the kids sitting up in my window, you know, because you'd see the person, you know, get there, and then you'd just kind of watch, and you, you know, the very slow move backwards, and then they'd swing in. And I'd sit up there in my window, and I would just wait for it. Because you look at the car and you look at the driver, and inevitably there's that scowl on their face. I mean, no one likes to come to a dead end. Do you know what's even worse than doing that on the road? It's coming to a dead end in life. You ever had one of those? You know what I'm talking about? I mean, for some of you, maybe that came in the form of a marriage. Struggling, you put a ton of effort into getting it corrected and getting it turned around, and yet it didn't seem to be going anywhere. For other people, that dead end comes in the form of relationships. You try hard to make it correct, but it just doesn't seem to go anywhere. Some of you have faced dead end health issues. You see all the right doctors, you take all the right medications, you do all the right exercises, and yet that pain's still there. And it doesn't seem to get any better. Some of you have been in dead end spots with your kids. You've taught them all the right things, you've tried to model those virtues for them, and yet they've decided they're still doing their own thing. And they aren't gonna listen. And you've had the pain of having to just watch them go off. Some of you know what it's like to be stuck in a dead-end job. You don't want to go to work. It's boring. You're totally unchallenged. You can think of a thousand other places that you would rather be than right there, and yet at the same time you realize, I don't really have any else place to go. This is it. If you've ever been at a dead end in life, then I think you're going to sympathize with Joseph as his life story continues to unfold for us in the pages of Genesis chapter 39, where it says this at the beginning. It says, now Joseph had been brought down to Egypt. And with that, Joseph found himself on the road to nowhere. You'll probably remember last week we left Joseph having just been sold off by his own brothers. All these dreams of prestige, prominence that he had, they had been absolutely pulverized and crushed. And now he is marching into the slave abyss called Egypt. The Egypt of Joseph's day was a world power. Its military strength was unbeatable, its wealth was unmatched. Now, on the whole, it was a nation like any other. It was mostly a nation of farmers who worked their small plots of land to raise their crops in order to support their families and be able to feed them. 
But Egypt was also a place that had a large bureaucratic government made up of a bunch of social elites, all who answered to this guy by the name of Pharaoh, who they happened to consider to be a god. And I think most of you know enough about world history to know that the Egyptians were builders of the pyramids and all sorts of other buildings. And as Joseph comes into Egypt, this was actually one of the times where some of the greatest building projects in Egyptian history were taking place. And yet that meant Egypt needed a lot of disposable workers, a lot of manpower. A lot of people, if they got killed or they got hurt, it didn't matter. And that's why they had developed a very large slave trade to bring in that necessary manpower to carry out these immense building projects of Pharaoh. And so when verse 1 tells us that Joseph comes into Egypt and he gets delivered to the local slave market, Joseph knew what was coming. He knew that he was most likely looking at the opportunity, if you can call it that, to spend the rest of his life doing hard, dangerous, manual labor. Hauling stones, building pyramids, possibly being crushed. It wasn't unusual to die young. And when you want to talk about being at a dead end, Joseph was there. Or was he? Look at the rest of verse 1. It says again, now Joseph had been brought down to Egypt. Notice what happens. And it says, And Potiphar, an officer of Pharaoh, the captain of the guard, an Egyptian, had bought him from the Israelites who had brought him down there. Hold on for a minute. You guys remember what the providence of God is? It's God's control and involving that in the small details of our life. It's what we've been talking about for the last couple of weeks. And almost right away in Joseph's case, as he goes into Egypt, we see God's providence go to work for him. Because instead of being bought up by the Egyptian engineering corps, instead it's a government official by the name of Potiphar who seizes Joseph out of that slave market and brings him into his house. And let me tell you, this was significant. Because Potiphar is no small fry in Egypt. Notice what it says about him there? He says he's the captain of the guard. Most likely meaning he was in charge of the small group of bodyguards that actually personally protected Pharaoh from harm. That means Potiphar is a government insider. He's got power. He's got influence. He's got prestige. And he's got wealth. In fact, most likely he lived in a small palace with a very significant number of slaves to carry out the menial tasks that are involved with running a large estate that included fields and animals and lots and lots of money. And for a slave like Joseph, this was about as good as it was going to get. But I want you to think about this. It was still a dead end. Because Joseph had no way of raising himself above his status as a slave. Certainly better than what it could have been, but still an unwanted assignment leading to nowhere. And it's at this rock bottom point in his life that Joseph begins to learn a faith changing lesson that each of us needs to take careful note of today. And that's this. At times, your sovereign, provident God plans for you to get stuck in the dead ends of life. I'm getting the same look from some of you that I got last week. Really? Really? You say, why? Well, Psalm 37, verse 23, puts it this way. It says, The steps of a man are established by the Lord, and he delights in his way. Stop and think about that for a minute. 
The steps of a man or a woman are in God's hands. They're established by Him. Because God is in control of everything, including our individual lives. That means He can actually order the direction of your life to end up wherever He pleases. Even in a dead-end situation. You say, I don't like that. I get it. Because again, most of us, when we hear about God's control and how thorough that is and how much that involves us and how he's in control over us, we kind of balk at that, don't we? Again, we want to be in control. We want to be the one determining where our lives are going. We want to be the one who are establishing our steps. And yet, that's not what the Word of God tells us. And here's something I've got to encourage you to get past today. We have got to get past this idea that God is just this grumpy, cruel dictator who, when he is in control of our lives, is making our lives absolutely positively miserable. You know how many people look at God that way? Actually, kind of reminds me of a video game that my daughter Meredith used to play. She had this video game where she had this Barbie person who was on a horse. And she was supposed to direct it around, and you know, they had different missions they were supposed to go to, and you know, when she accomplished it, she would win some prize or something for it. But Meredith was funny because every time she played this game, eventually she would get bored of it. And when she got bored of it, what she started to do is she would have started to take her control, and she would actually make the horse run. And you remember doing this, Mary? And jumping off the cliff. <laughs> Over and over and over. And she would just sit there and giggle to herself the whole time. And I'm like, what are you doing? She goes, it's fun. And I can do it. I'm in control. Can I just say, thankfully, God's not like that. (laughs) Okay? Because notice what the verse says. It says, the steps of a man are established by the Lord. Okay? He is in control of our lives. He is the one who's setting that direction. He is the one who gets to choose how our life is going to be. But notice the end. He delights in his way. Do you know that's how God feels about you? If you're his child here today. He delights in you. He cares about you. He wants your best. And that means sometimes in his infinite wisdom and love, God knows sometimes that best place for you is at a rock bottom dead end, just like it was for Joseph at this moment in his life. And here's where your confidence in God's sovereignty and providence has got to start to kick in, my friends. Since God makes very clear to us in his word that he is always in control, you know what that means? It means in reality, there is never a dead spot in your life. Never. Instead, God wants us to believe that under his control, what feels like dead ends are actually incredible opportunities for two reasons. God never wastes opportunities or makes mistakes. And God is always preparing you to achieve his ultimate plans and purposes for you. And I don't want you guys to just take my word for that. Notice how these two truths start to unfold in Joseph's dead-end situation. First one again says this. It says, Joseph had been brought down to Egypt. Potiphar, an officer of Pharaoh, the captain of the guard, an Egyptian, had bought him from the Israelites who had bought him, had brought him down there. Notice what happens. Verse 2. It says, The Lord was with Joseph. And he became a successful man. And he was in the house of his Egyptian master. His master saw that the Lord was with him. And the Lord caused all that he did to succeed in his hands. So Joseph found favor in his sight and attended him. 
And he made him overseer of his house and put him in charge of all that he had. From the time that he made him overseer in his house and over all that he had, the Lord blessed the Egyptian's house for Joseph's sake. The blessing of the Lord was on all that he had in house and field. So he left all that he had in Joseph's charge, verse 6 tells us, and became of him. He had no concern about anything but the food that he ate. Are you following all that? I mean, it's almost dizzying to think about. Joseph walks in as a dead-end slave, non-existent peon. Next thing he knows, he's got a little bit more responsibility. And he becomes personal attendant to Potiphar. And then all of a sudden he turns around and he's running the whole show in Potiphar's house. Whoa! What happened here? And then make things even more complicated. Verse 2. It actually calls him a successful man. Help me out again. What was Joseph's position in life right now? Slave. slave. Success. Slave. How's that go together? I mean, it seems almost ludicrous to describe him that way. But then again, I hope you picked up on this. These verses make very clear Joseph wasn't just your ordinary run-of-the-mill slave. And all because of one reason. The Lord was with Joseph. Now again, I guess it's got to cause you guys to stop and think about that for a minute. Because it almost, if you really stop to think about it, it's really almost as ludicrous to say that as it was to call Joseph successful. I mean, again, Joseph is at the bottom of the pecking scale. He's got no future ahead of him. Why in the world would God care enough about Joseph to be with Joseph in this house and in his slavery, and in this non-existent part of his life where it seemed like it was absolutely, positively going nowhere. Why would God care? Why was he with Joseph? One reason. This was exactly where God planned for Joseph to be at this point in his life. This is where God wanted him. As crazy as that seems. You see, God had some very good reasons for landing Joseph in this dead-end job. God knew that ultimately, one day, Joseph would be running Egypt. He would be saving the world. He would have a major assignment in life. But you know what? Joseph wasn't ready for that assignment yet. And so what did God do? He went to work on Joseph. And he put him in a dead-end job so that he could address some needs that Joseph had. Needs like a deeper faith in God. Needs like some character issues and some skills that he needed to develop. As difficult as a situation as this was for Joseph, he was exactly where God wanted him to be. Even if that was a dead-end situation. In fact, I would even say in God's plan, there was actually no better place for Joseph to be at this point in his life than being a slave. Because it's as a slave, Joseph begins to understand God in ways that he never understood him before. You see, God was constantly supervising and caring for and controlling every single circumstance in Joseph's life. 
But did Joseph get that? Probably not. I think God put him here because he wanted Joseph to get to the point where he owned the fact that God was always with him, no matter whether things were going really, really good or whether they were going really, really bad. And every single day that Joseph got up and he looked around and says, oh, I'm a slave. He got reminded about that. God was right there. And then there's this whole success thing that goes on. Do you realize God is the source of all success? That's what his word tells us. Joseph had to learn that. Remember last week we talked about his dreams. How he knew someday he was going to be great. He was going to be provident. All right? Those things at 17, they inflate your head a little bit. But now he's a slave. No place to go. And yet all sorts of good things are happening to him. And you know what Joseph is beginning to realize through that? It's not about me. It's not about my abilities. It's not about what I can do. It's about God. In fact, I love how the text is explicit. How everyone in Potiphar's house, including Joseph, began to understand God was the reason that Joseph had the Midas touch. I mean, verse 3, how much clearer can you get? It says, the Lord is with him, and the Lord caused all that he did to succeed in his hands. Okay, this wasn't about Joseph, this was about God. Beyond that, there were issues of character that God was working on. And Joseph was learning things like servanthood and humility and trustworthiness and a hard work ethic. Lessons that he was not learning back home because he was dad's favorite and didn't have to do anything. And then there was these issues of skill. Again, Joseph's life had been pretty easy to this point. But all of a sudden, he finds himself in charge of the entire household. You want to talk about getting thrown into the fire and having to learn management skills really, really, really fast, okay? That's what happened with Joseph. But he had to learn to coordinate people and on goods and money and property and time and all sorts of things. And it wasn't easy. But all those things were put there and allowed by God because each step of the way, God was building Joseph and preparing him for what lay ahead. And the only way Joseph was going to get that was if he was in a dead-end situation like being a slave in Egypt. And I love this. Because each step of the way is God blessed Joseph. If you happen to catch, he also blesses Potiphar. It says there in verse 4, Joseph found favor in his sight. He attended him, put him in charge of all that he had. Verse 6, I'm sorry, verse 5, it says, The blessing of the Lord was on all that he had in house and field. So much to the point that he gets to the, the side and he says, you know what, Joseph? God's blessing you so much. Things are going so well. Why don't you just take over everything? Again, think about this. This is a slave from a foreign land. And maybe the second or third most powerful man in the world is saying, why don't you run my house for me? The biggest decision I want to make every day is whether I'm having pizza or a cheeseburger for dinner. That's it. But again, it wasn't about Joseph. People were saying this was the God who controls it all, who is making this work and happen.
You see, under God's control, everything was turning out the best possible good in Joseph's life. And even the Egyptians were noticing there was something special about Joseph's God. And something I want to make very clear to us. That's what the sovereignty and providence of God is all about. Not just your good. As much as God delights in you. But even more importantly, it's about His glory. It's about people standing up and noticing we have a God who is over it all and demands and deserves to be followed with everything that we have. Because God wants everyone to know that he is in control even when you or I or anybody else is stuck at a dead end in life. So let's wrap up this section of Joseph's story in this way. How do we apply God's control to our dead ends? At some point in your life, you're probably going to reach one. And you're going to butt heads with it. You're going to feel very, very stuck. What do I do? What do I need to realize? What do I need to believe about God's control? Here's the first one. A dead end does not mean God is not there. Because you know what? God never bailed out on Joseph, did he? I mean, verse 2 is so clear about that, isn't it? The Lord was with Joseph. And can I remind you? God's never bailing out on you either. Never. He's always in control. He always knows what is best. And he always loves you. Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 5 puts it this way. It says, For he himself, talking about Jesus, said, I will never leave you or forsake you. And so that means for you, is when God brings you to that dead end in your life, you're not alone. He's right there beside you. He's carrying out his perfect plan for your life, exercising his total control. If you find yourself in a dead end, I would challenge you, but I would encourage you to be asking yourself this. Am I looking for God to show up in this dead end situation? Or have I just given up? Sometimes that's the temptation, isn't it? But when we realize and we believe we have a God in control, we should never do that. Because a dead end does not mean God is not there. And then notice the second lesson, alright? A dead end, it's full of lessons to be learned. What this was all about for Joseph, wasn't it? He wasn't ready yet. He had some lessons of faith, some lessons of character, some lessons of skill that he had to get under his belt in order to be prepared for the next phase that God had for him. That's no different for us. I don't know about you guys, but I don't got life figured out yet. I got a lot of growing to do. A lot of things I've got to learn to believe about God that I don't always hold on to like I'm supposed to. Some skills that I don't have. And there have been moments when I have found myself in dead-end situations just like Joseph, all because of that. One of the most memorable for me actually came very, very early in our marriage. We got married with the ambition and the goal and the plan to be heading to Arizona and working as missionaries among the Navajo Indians. And because of circumstances that I won't explain right now, that plan went south very, very quickly. It went <laughs> And all of a sudden we found ourselves like, what do you do? So we did what good people did. You got a job. And you started working. Lisa was working as a waiter, or waitress, I'm sorry, not a waiter, but a waitress. All right. I was working in a little factory doing die casting, dumping metal in a machine every single day. You know how boring that is? You scoop it out, you dump it in, you push the button, you scoop it out, you dump it in, you push the button. I did that for eight hours, ten hours a day. All the while wondering, what are you doing, God? 
Isn't life supposed to be about more than this? But I serve a sovereign, provident God who put me in a dead-end situation because he knew I had some lessons to learn. Some lessons about what it means to get up every day to work hard. He had me as a deacon in our church that time so I could learn how a church ran and the ins and outs of that. He had me teaching Sunday school classes so I could develop some skills that I didn't possess yet. Because God knew shortly down the road he was calling me into ministry. But I wasn't ready yet. And again, I don't know what dead-end situations you might be staring down in your life right now. Well, whatever it is, I hope that you will make Psalm 27 and verse 11 your prayer. Teach me your way, O Lord. Because when we find ourselves in dead-end situations, our first reaction shouldn't be, stink. I don't want to be here. It should be, God, what do you want me to learn through this? What do I need to get a hold of because of what you have next? It's what Joseph was doing. All the while trusting this third lesson. A dead in your life is not likely to last forever. You realize that? I know it feels like it. Again, you're scooping metal, dumping, dunk, 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 dunk. You're wondering, where is this going? How is this going to work? But you know what? You're in pretty good company if you find yourself in a situation like that. You know that? I mean, think about all the people from the Bible who are in dead-end situations at some point during their lifetime. Guys like Moses, who spent 40 years staring at sheep, Or a guy by the name of David, who spent uh, two plus years of his life running around hiding in caves just so he could stay alive. Or a guy by the name of Paul, who spent multiple years in prison waiting a trial that we still don't even know to this day ever came about. Or a guy by the name of John, who was an old man, was exiled to a place called Patmos. Figuring, that's it. My life's done. And yet God used dead-end moments like that to shape every single one of them because he had a plan and he wanted them to minister in new ways and in new roles. Just like God was doing with Joseph and is most likely going to do with you. Actually, I read the true story of a guy this week I'd never heard of. But he had graduated several years ago at the top of his seminary class. I mean, incredible grades. Got snatched up by church almost right away. Began what he thought was going to be a great and long ministry. But he found himself fired after three years. I mean, they just flat out fired him. He figured it wasn't going to be a big deal. I mean, had a resume now. I had a lot of people who could back him up on his knowledge, what he knew. But he actually spent the next three years after that doing nothing but delivering newspapers. This was during a recession. He couldn't find a job. Every single day, first thing in the morning, this guy who's got tons of degrees, tons of knowledge, for three years. And you want to talk about feeling like you're stuck in a dead end. But 
We have a God who controls it all, don't we? This guy, as he was taking care of newspapers, delivering them every day, he happened to meet an editor to a newspaper who happened to know an editor at a book company who happened to know the editor at a major Christian publisher who just happened to be looking for a job who had some serious theological qualifications and wanted someone who could come in and look at every single book that they were printing and say, is this accurate or not? This guy I was telling you about, there were two things he loved in life. Theology and books. And he said, I didn't even know such a position existed. And yet he has now spent the last 25 years of his life serving as content editor of this Christian publisher, checking every single book that they have to make sure it's theologically accurate, and in doing so, literally affecting the lives of thousands of people around the world every single day. And part of the reason he shared his story is because I know what it's like to feel like in a dead end. But that doesn't mean that's where God's keeping you. You see, when God sees that you are ready and prepared to move on, he'll move you on. It might be days, it might be weeks, it might be even years, but when God is accomplishing you what he intends to accomplish, he will take you to what he has for you to do next. I mean, isn't that again what Psalm 37, 23 teaches us? It says, the steps of the Lord are, um, sorry, steps of a man are established by the Lord. And it delights in his way. And I want you guys to know, God delights in making you into all that he wants you to be. And using you for all that he has purposed to use you for. And because he is in control, you can be 100% confident that not even a dead end can stand in his way. Amen? Amen. Father, we thank, and thank you for the chance to open up your word this morning. We thank you for this wonderful truth that a dead end is never the end with you. You never waste opportunities. You always have a plan. You are always making the best happen for us because you want us to be like Jesus. Help us to believe that. Help us to claim today that we can always believe that when you are establishing our steps, you know exactly what you're doing. And we can be confident in that. And Lord, I just want to pray over anyone here today who's maybe looking at a dead-end situation in their life. Again, those feel awful. And I pray that, you know, we as a body of believers will be able to come around them and just be able to be of help and encouragement to them. But even more than that, help them to learn to own what this truth that we've been learning together, that you are in control of it all. And that means that you are even in control of their lives and their situations and the dead ends that they are facing. Thank you for being sovereign. Thank you for being provident. Thank you for being our big God. Help us to come to believe you and to follow you with all our hearts, just like Joseph did. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.